Hello, everybody. I have an amazing guest for you on the show today. He is an artist and goes by the name Darko Silverstein. And what he wants to share with you today is this idea of using art to discover your life narrative. And he comes from a storytelling background and doesn't just use storytelling as a way to, you know, entertain people. Of course, it's always used to entertain people, but also as a way to help to craft your own life story and even help to make your art more effective. Because with every single piece, some people think of art as like, oh, just a picture of a person. But as you start to like dive deeper into art, you start to realize that, you know, some of these artists put a lot in. There's so much story behind some of the different pieces that come be, uh, with every single uh, piece. So from like the, the, the colors, the details and uh, things like that. But anyway, hey, Darko, thank you for jumping on to this episode. How are you today? Well, thank you for having me. I'm uh, doing well. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share what I know about this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So, you know, just to get started, can you uh, share a little bit about like, you know, what got you into art in the first place? Because, you know, I, I, I was out there drawing the other day. And I think this is something very important to touch on is like as adults, you know, I was just out, I was out there in like the outside, just randomly drawing, sketching. And, you know, I was thinking, does this look kind of childish, you know, but here's the thing is like, I look at some of the people I admire, these great artists, these pen and paper artists that are just out there drawing. And I'm like, wow, this is so amazing. These people are so great. And I'm like, you know, for a moment, I have this thought, I'm like, does it, you know, the people think I'm just a kid or whatever, because I look kind of young for my age. But you know, what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on, you know, diving into art, you know, maybe later in, in your adulthood is I mean, is there a realistic possibility, like, share stuff about that? I mean, I'm, I'm banking on the idea that it's a real possibility, you know, because uh, I, I took years where I didn't do art. Uh, like you said, like, as a child, obviously, you know, I think most artists start out with that kind of innate interest, usually, and it, it, it expresses when you're young. But, you know, life happens. And, you know, particularly like somebody my age, like growing up in the 90s and the early 2000s, it's like, you know, there wasn't a huge industry around art, or at least that wasn't something you'd hear about regularly. And I think, you know, little by little, you kind of get discouraged out of it. And, you know, at some point, you kind of have to pick it back up if that's something that's innate to who you are. And, and it's something that, you know, expressed itself in you before you were aware of why you shouldn't indulge that, you know, it's going to try to come back out of you. And, you're going to have to start wherever you are. And if that's at a point where, where you left off when you were 10 years old, then that's where you start. But now you get to approach it with a grown up brain and, you know, tackle these problems of like, okay, well, do I feel like this is coming from a, a like younger perspective? Like, okay, maybe it is, but you know, I'm at the point I'm at now and I need to approach this in kind of a problem solving way if I want to get better or, you know, I don't even think there's anything wrong with expressing something that comes from a more childlike place inside of you. Cause I really do feel like, uh, you know, that version of yourself never really like stops working in you somewhere, you know, and, and it probably wants to be expressed. And, and if that's where that's the part of you, you're expressing yourself from artistically, then, then that's the part of you that has something to say, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that I, thought was interesting that you were talking about is this idea that when you know there's this idea in art that when you watch people draw you can kind of tell like when they stop learning how to draw I don't remember where exactly I read that but you know if they're still drawing stick figures then at some point like you know in like maybe the fifth grade is when they actually stop trying to learn how to like draw something or if they're still like you know they draw like good shapes and good figures and they could kind of draw an arm but it still looks like kind of weird then they drew they stopped learning in maybe like the eighth grade or high school but what I also thought was interesting about what you were saying is like this ex self-expression coming out and that you know having that gap in your life of when you stop drawing as a kid to like when you start drawing as an adult you start to have like you know, this problem solving of having all these great stories, these 
you know, unique perspectives as you grow older. So uh, it sounds like that was an experience you had that you, you know, you found you had more stories as an adult than you are as a kid. When you're like a kid, you're probably just like, you know, throwing whatever's cool out of them. I, whatever's cool that's out there. That's like, you know, okay, whatever. Um, let me just draw these cool spaceships that go in the water. And then, you know, you're, you're unlimited, but as you're an adult, you start to come up with your story, which I think was something that, you know, you kind of made me think about, but um, what is your experience to, you know, that, that movement from stopping art and then the decision to like jump back in? Well, I think you were definitely onto something with like, being able to tell when somebody stopped learning with art like I think for me when I picked it back up it was like this is a like 10th grade boy doing this like expressing himself from somewhere inside of me you know it's it, and it was kind of exactly like you said it's like the anatomy was okay and like you know I could draw like a comic book superhero arm type of vibe but you know anything more subtle than that and I was struggling and that was something I had to learn uh, but you're really onto something with that point about when you're a kid, it's just kind of like, everything's cool. Everything's interesting. Everything's new. And, you know, you watch like Power Rangers. So you draw Power Rangers or, you know, whatever you're interested in and you don't really have anything unique to yourself yet. Or, or if you do, you haven't really like spent time ruminating on what it meant for you to have had that unique experience. And, you know, so that kind of stuff just isn't really making it into how you're expressing yourself artistically. And I think that's definitely something that was a part of bringing me back around to getting into art is, you know, I, I felt like I got way off course with who I had intended to be when I was younger. And it all happened around that age that I stopped doing art. And, you know, I, I don't think the two are unrelated. And I, I think in that same way that, you know, the things that I was going through in my life at the time were a part of me moving away from art. Art was a part of me getting back on course from all these years of kind of going down on all these side paths and, and kind of feeling like lost in the wilderness, metaphorically, you know, where I think a lot of a lot of how I got back into art was trying to process through, like, what am I supposed to do with myself? you know I'm you know through my 20s and stuff it was like I felt like I was kind of just floating through life looking for something to do with myself and you know when things weren't materializing in my actual life the way I wanted you know I, I was working a job I wasn't into I didn't feel like it utilized any of my skills and in fact it leaned heavily on things I'm really weak at and you know I was just kind of dissatisfied and I I kind of retreated back into that that fantasy of like, you know, I'd, I had more fun expressing my life in these narratives and then I'd get attached to these characters and little by little I started like, well, I, I need to draw this character to really like get more in contact with the experience of this narrative. And, you know, little by little I was demanding more of myself artistically until I was actually improving again. And I was learning in a way that I didn't feel like I had been learning for years. And, you know, little by little, like you start watching tutorials because you're like, well, I really have to learn how to draw a trident in perspective or something. And I need to figure out how to set up a perspective grid. So I'll watch a YouTube tutorial. And maybe you end up like on a YouTube channel where they're talking about how to do concept art and stuff. And that's really how I came about getting back into art professionally was that exact path of like kind of just diving into these narratives and needing to go that step further than I was able to go to inhabit that space you know yeah for sure and you, you mentioned something this idea of um you know when you're connecting with a with a subject or the person that is that you know you're doing art a p art piece on and i thought that was really interesting because i i draw a lot like when i'm just randomly out and i'm in like a in uh airport i'll like draw and you know i won't let people know that i'm drawing but i'm just drawing them and i just think you know this i wouldn't have never taken more than a 10 second look at this person probably but now that you know i'm looking at them i'm really like you know trying to know what this person is like and you learn you can learn so much and in that sense you can't it's even tough to do that with you know with 
photography because you know people don't in an airport don't watch you taking photos of them and like you know just <laughs> candidly doing that but you know i think with uh with digital graphic you know the digital or not digital but um pen and paper you you know you have an opportunity to just kind of like take a look up and like you know learn about their face and I, i've done done a lot in um you know head drawing and that's like a basic foundation of like figures and stuff and it's like you really start to look at people's faces differently, like where, how their jaws are shaped and how their foreheads and all that. So you really do get that sense of, uh, I think what, what you said was like connection or something, something like uh, getting more related to the things that you're drawing. But um, okay. So that was, that was really neat. And there's this awesome idea of, uh, you know, the life narrative or having an art narrative. Can you, explain what you mean by narrative is it simply like oh this per this is a character and then there's a knife in the background why is there a knife in the background right like is it that kind of narrative or is it do you have a different like example of it yeah i mean i think it's kind of it's there's so many levels to the narrative you can put into anything and i think for me like a big part of coming out of that kind of haze of misdirection in my 20s was being able to understand that like you know we perceive our own lives through the narratives we tell ourselves about them you know like it's it's very hard to actually see yourself clearly and you know i i was running into that where it was like why am i so dissatisfied with how i'm getting by right now and i had to kind of look at the narratives i was putting myself in, in my own storytelling about myself. But in doing that, I like, you know, you kind of look at everything and you realize there's, there's story behind everything. Wait, so, and, so here's a quick question. So sorry, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but I think you just mentioned something really important there. You mentioned this idea of putting yourself in these narratives. Like, I think that's pretty significant because at some level where we are in life, I mean, a lot of us tend to, I don't want to say we put ourselves in like, situations that might be bad but you know we can end up telling narratives that uh or crafting our life in a way that isn't conducive to what we really want so can you share a little bit about that like what did you mean by that like you put yourself in your own narrative well i mean it, i think you're onto something where it's like you can really steer yourself in, in a bunch of different directions you know and oftentimes if you're not in control of the, or at least for me, not being in control of the idea that I was experiencing my life as a narrative, it, I was kind of letting the narrative write itself. Like I was on autopilot about how I was perceiving the world around me. And it was, you know, I, I was working as a bartender, even though I'm really terrible at like interacting with strangers and like, you know, I have a terrible memory. Like people could tell me three times what they ordered and I would forget it by the time I was halfway through making the drink. Like it, it just, it leaned on everything I was bad at. And, you know, but that was one of the things is like, I had this narrative running that, you know, because I, I had kind of like a tumultuous set of teen years where, you know, I was getting into trouble and stuff. And, and that, that really affected the narrative I told about myself about, you know, oh, well, I, I can't operate in a professional environment because, you know, that's not who I am. I'm this kid who gets in trouble. And like, you know, a decade had gone by since I had gotten in any trouble, but that narrative was still running of I'm this person who has that background. That's my backstory. And, you know, the only place that'll have me is a dive bar kind of thing, you know? And, and yeah. Like, it's it's wild how much that that will inform you you know about about yourself and then you kind of slot yourself into the the positions that that you're writing for yourself and and in that exact same way that's how i got into doing concept art and got out of doing that was kind of coming to this new narrative of like no i'm not this like troubled kid who just is uh, you know a person who can't get it together i you know i have this narrative of like when I was younger and I didn't have the weight of the world on my shoulders, I, I was watching Star Wars and I wanted nothing more than to create a world like that. And, and you know, in this new narrative, it's, it's like a story of redemption where I now have to create these worlds that, that I had on pause this whole time. 
and and that's taken me in a totally different life direction yeah dude that is powerful like putting that i don't want uh, responsibility might be the wrong word but like putting that like uh that purpose for yourself of wanting to create something really interesting and amazing. And one thing that I got from you is this idea of, you know, overcoming that idea that, that you were a troubled kid. But I think where this can relate to many of us is this idea that, you know, maybe we weren't all troubled, troubled or whatever in an art sense, but at some level for those of people who want to get back into art as like an adult, or even, you know, after, college i consider you know people that just graduated from college not fully adults like they're they're adults you can trust them but like they haven't really like fully handled the world but um but this idea of if you have the narrative that you're not a great artist and you want to overcome that so you can you know pursue a career in art such as you know drawing or something like that or you just want to pick it up as a hobby like you know and you have this narrative running in your head oh, I'm not a good artist. I can't ever draw. I'll never be able to like, you know, do something cool or like something like that. So for someone who's in that situation, you know, since you were able to overcome that narrative of, you know, you're not just a troubled kid anymore or anything like that. What were some of the strategies or anything that you did to actually overcome that, that doubt or that narrative? Well, it, it was if definitely you like, oh yeah, for sure. For sure. It's, you know, it, it's one of those things that it can be really hard to pinpoint because it's such a gradual process of, you know, yeah, you can sit here and like conceptually say, I'd like to write a narrative of myself where, you know, I'm a billionaire or something, you know, but like, it, it's like, I'm not, I'm not going to see that, you know, actually taking place. And there's, there's no actual like struggle there of, of how I become that, you know, it's kind of just purely a fantasy, but, you know, well, taking the example of, you know, becoming an artist when you, when you're telling yourself that narrative of, oh, I'm not a good artist. I I look on art station and everybody is operating at just like elite caliber, you know, works and, and I'm, I'm mediocre at best or something, you know, and you have that narrative going and it's like, whether it's true or not is irrelevant. You know, I, I would say like, the strategy would be to not tell yourself a fantasy where like, oh, in fact, I'm actually a better artist than these people when you know you're not, you know, you're not there yet. But but tell yourself the the narrative of, you know, I it, like I said, like for me, it, it was had to switch to a redemption narrative. It was like, yeah, I got off course. Yeah, I nowhere near where I could have been had I just applied myself from when I had this childhood ability you know but the narrative can't just be and so i failed and i will always fail you know and i'm going to struggle forever and i'm never going to be as good as insert your favorite artist you know instead it's kind of a story of like well maybe maybe i don't get all the way to where i want to be but you know when i listen to the artists i admire they all say they're not where they want to be either and you know I kind of have to work towards this redemption narrative of, you know, okay, I got way off course, but at some point I got back into taking it seriously. And not only am I taking it seriously, but I'm pushing myself even harder now to make up for that lost time that I'm actively acknowledging happened. You know, it's, it's kind of a delicate balance of fantasy and being brutally honest with yourself. Yeah, totally. And uh, as they, as I've heard before, uh, actually pretty recently, more, more pretty recently, um, you know, this idea of seeing things as they are, but not worse than they are. And also mm-hmm. this idea of, you know, as you craft your life story, it doesn't always have to be like, I used to be this person and now I'm going to become this person, but giving yourself like a purpose of that redemption element, you know, to, it's not just like, um, oh, well, I used to be, I wasn't good at it. So now I'm just going to go and be good at it. But like, you have a reason to do so you have, you know, something that you can actually, it's not faking it till you make it. It's more like, you know, actually crafting, you know, that, that challenge for yourself, that adventure for yourself. And Mm -hmm. yeah. So I thought that was, that was really great. Thank you. And um, all right. So can you go a little bit more into that? Like what, what other ways? Yeah. Thanks. 
I, I would say, I mean, even to keep it in, in like a, a storytelling context, you got to go through the training montage part of the movie, you know, but you don't get to chop from step to step. You have to just grind through it, you know. The but, training montage is usually of, my favorite part, by the way. I Like when you see Batman yeah. training or whatever, but yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. You just throw on some like 80s hair metal in the background and <laughs> get to it. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's it's like you said, it's it's kind of, it, you have to be real with yourself about like, you know, I'm not going to just like pull the sword out of the stone and suddenly I'm, you know, the top dog, you know, it's, it's like, I, I have to do the training montage. I have to grind through this. I have to accept that I'm not as good as I want to be. And honestly, I think that's a huge part of being an artist. And I, I would even say for me, and it does seem like it applies somewhat universally you know, the desire to even create anything at all, it comes from like a fundamental dissatisfaction with the way things are currently. And, you know, I think a lot of artists, because that's what drives us, we, we can easily get overwhelmed by that dissatisfaction and we can just get really negative about it and really defeatist about it. And, you know, I think, I think artists need to look at that dissatisfaction more as a part of the gift of being an artist is that it's it's an engine that drives your desire to make something new you know you want like yeah i like my you know i i like these cool arche archaeological photos of like roman statues or something but like some part of me is like ah oh, it would have been cooler if it was bigger though like or what if like the statue had had like a way more elaborate spear or something and, and it's like and you're just kind of like sometimes reality falls flat and you just want to spice it up a little bit, but it, it definitely, it can go wrong because there is that, that dissatisfaction element to, to the desire to be creative. Yeah. And it's so, I really like how you keep giving these examples of like writing a movie with your life. It's pretty neat because, you know, you made me think about this as I, as I mentioned, like some of my favorite parts of like action movies is literally watching the hero and how they build up and, you know, seeing Rocky climb the things and the training montages and all that. And with that, you know, it, it goes back to an example of, you know, there's a lot of people who watch that and just think about how cool it is. And they're like, oh, well, he just skipped, you know, 10, 10 months of training. And now he's like a superstar. And they don't really think because it happens in like, you know, 30 seconds or like five minutes of the movie. And then they don't really think about, you know, the actual work that goes through. And sometimes people like quit or they give up when it actually starts to get hard, but to apply this, this element of turning that into like a life narrative to telling a story with it and to, you know, making that part of your movie montage, that struggle and those challenges and, you know, you running to the top of the, the stairs. I, I think that really adds a, a, a very powerful motivation if you know you need to be self-motivated if you you know don't have like someone telling you to go be better or whatever so that that's great that is awesome i really like that and um all right and here's a here's a quick question so as since we went on that subject of moving and you know looking at the montage and looking at challenges and things like that um, you know, what are your thoughts around overcoming those challenges? Like, you know, we see the montage, we think it's cool. We see them just constantly pushing through it. And then the, the, the challenge doesn't come until they actually fight the, the arch nemesis and their training finally comes out. But really, I think that for, for real life outside of movies, the real struggle is, you know, those moments and pushing yourself beyond your limits in those moments that, so that you're prepared. So what are your thoughts on using narrative or, you know, an example of like how to actually you know, tackle the challenges that we face day to day in, in terms of like our doubts about our skills and all that. For sure. Yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's important to like, keep in mind that like, okay, so what we watch as the viewer in, in Rocky, for example, is he has all these moments where we see a clear progression, you know, he's, he's putting in the work and he's getting the payoff and we believe he, he might be good enough, you know, by the end. And we see that all happen quickly, like you said. But if you were to be Rocky, and if this was a real set of circumstances that took place, you know, that's weeks of drinking a big old, old cup full of raw 
eggs every morning. They suffer for these being exhausted the rest of the day. Pay the bill he had. I, I don't seen it in a while, but you know, it's it, it would be a lot of suffering on his part. You know, like in, in the meantime, he's still living his day to day life, and you know, we're just getting the good parts. And I think that's sometimes where people get discouraged is like, you know. If you're looking at your life as a narrative, you have to keep in mind that like, how do you chop out those parts that that make the final cut? And how do you give yourself credit for those when they happen? You know, like it, it's not going to be a part of the montage every day you work on it. But, you know, maybe one out of seven days you sit down and, and grind through it, you end up with something you're like a little bit proud of and you see like, I did get a little bit better with this and okay, chop that out and put that in the montage in your own memory, you know, and, and kind of hold on to those little victories. Cause like you said, in real life, it kind of works in a more nebulous way. Like it's not, it's not all fitting into a two hour runtime where at the end you either succeed or don't. It's like every day is kind of, you know, these little, little bits of the montage and it's it's all working towards you know these these milestones you set for yourself but there's a million milestones you set for yourself and they can all be kind of crisscrossing over each other but you know I think like for me right now it's like I've been working on this sci-fi fantasy book that kind of got me into doing artwork again in a big way and that's kind of like the big climax to my narrative right now is like uh, I'll know I've really like gone up and like fought the final boxing match when when I have like a draft of this book finished and I have the artwork to go with it and I'm like okay this is what I've been training for I, it's here I'm holding it in my hands and you know kind of allowing myself to be content with the fact that you know I don't control every aspect of of the narrative just like in a movie there's you know there's other forces at work that are trying to interrupt the hero's journey, you know, and, you know, those things will shape the outcome. And, and, you know, I think that's something to be careful with, you know, kind of as one of the downsides to looking at things as a narrative is there's this tendency to kind of become very, you know, wrapped up in your own idea of how things were supposed to work out. And that's not really how storytelling works. Like good storytelling is kind of, you know, the character starts out one way, they go out into the world, they get the crap kicked out of them for a while, they learn something, and then they come back with the thing they really needed. And it doesn't really matter whether they got what they thought they wanted or not. The movie is fulfilling when they get what they really needed at the end. So it's it's important to kind of allow life to influence you back and not just like try to hammer your narrative into everything that you see around you. But I, I think that in a lot of ways, affect how art comes out too because art works the same way where it's like it's it's kind of a mix of things you've been inspired by and then your own twist that you put on it and kind of looking at your life that way you know that there's there's these influences that get exerted on you that are beyond your control but what what twist do you put on it like what what creative influence can you have on those things yeah and so in in sh I, I really appreciate those questions at the, the at the end there this um you know what twists can you put and, and things like that because it really makes you think and you know when you're going through a situation you know when you're here i think when you're listening to an a podcast like this someone talk about this idea of crafting that life narrative i mean it's one thing to hear the other person uh talk about it but it's also so helpful to actually get questions that are catered to you or even just broad questions that are helpful to help the person who's, you know, anybody listening to the idea of crafting their narrative. So um, to get an idea, I mean, what are some, some ways, you know, for say someone is, is like a not natural storyteller and, but, you know, they want to get back into the graphic arts. They, you know, love like graphic design or, you know, they used to have a passion for it, but they, you know, got into like a less, creative less narrative driven um you know style of work career or whatever um how what would you what would be your advice in 
telling or in getting someone to care, craft their narrative? I mean, I would say, like that? I would say like a good place to start is kind of just go back and, and look through your life and kind of like ask yourself when I think about what got me here, what were the big impact moments? What were the, you know, what were the phases of my life that really influenced me? And what did those things feel like? What did it, what was, what was it like to be in that phase of my life? What was it like to have this event take place? You know, uh, and then I know for me personally, a lot of times what I do is it's kind of like a therapeutic thing is I'll, I'll go back and I'll look through all the, all the things that have happened over the years. And then it influences my art and, and kind of drives my art by then I'll think about, well, what, what could be a cool way to express that same sentiment? You know, like, uh, let's say, for example, you know, you were, you were struggling in school or something. You had, you had, uh, this is very unique to my story, possibly, but, you know, I always had problems with authority when I was growing up. And so let's say I want to revisit that phase of my life. And, you know, I think that's, that's a big part of crafting narrative is, look at the narratives that were important to you. And for me, it's like, okay, issues with authority when I was younger. Well, right away, like the whole cyberpunk genre is kind of all about like abuse of power, you know, these corporate authorities and, you know, and the people who have to live in these societies and they're, they're always dystopian, and, you know, and it, and it kind of feels how it felt to be a rebellious kid in public school, you know? And yeah. it's like, even though like, if I were to just tell that story, it's like, okay, I was like a melodramatic kid just being angsty. But when you convert it into this thing that's kind of analogous to it, that has all the same core components of what it felt like to be there, it, it stops being corny because it's like, it, it's not just a, a kid in public school who doesn't want to be there and listen to what the teachers say. It's, it's this larger, cooler world where those same themes can play out. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I could totally imagine that being an, a, a, an idea right there is think about like what stories you feel like you could have seen yourself in as a kid because you already know that story, you know, and you can put that into some sort of movie, but it doesn't even have to be like a realistic modern movie. Like think about just what popular genres that are out there right now. Is it more steampunk or cyberpunk? Is it more like, you know, sci-fi or, you know, space opera, something like that. So that's, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. I really like that idea. And um, all right. So it sounds like you spent a lot of time, like, you know, go thinking about, you, you really spent a lot of time, like thinking about how to turn your, not turn your life into narrative, but like, or, or create a narrative with your experiences and all that. Um, so in terms of your art right now, I think it's really great that you're doing not just like the graphic side of things, but this multi, multi, multi uh, thing where you're doing both the graphic art and the story. Uh, you said you're writing a, a, a story right now, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So is there, does it, does it help to do that? Like I know some artists uh, you know, they, they focus on one thing and one thing on like a writer does writing and writing only. And that's like what they, what they do, but does it actually help you? Or do you just feel like, you know, it's just the skill that you wanted to build the, the graphic arts or, you know, can you explain that process a little bit? I, I think for me personally, I started out drawn to the visual side of art. And I think you know, what I, what I was always doing when I look back at it is I've always been drawn to doing characters. And it was kind of something I, I realized when I picked it back up later in life that like what I was doing by drawing these characters was kind of expressing this whole world that they existed in. And like, even though I was, you know, and at the time, mostly what I was drawing is I'd draw their head, I'd get to their shoulders, it would get a little looser. And I'd kind of be like, all right, whatever, you know, and I'd move on because I would lose confidence along the way. But, you know, but still in that time frame, I was kind of coming up with this whole, you know, what is this character in the middle of what, what, you know, what is their story in this moment? And those kinds of things were almost like a meditation that was just running in the background while I was drawing. And 
you know, so the two have always been very tied together, but in terms of like what I was doing with concrete steps, it was always much more the visual side, but I think sitting down and actually writing stuff out and like having to do some research about like, what are the fundamentals of storytelling and like, you know, what, what are authors saying about how storytelling works? What are screenwriters saying about how it works? Uh, you know, what are, what are common tropes? What are common plot devices? And all of that has really affected how I approach art now and gotten me to a level where I actually have more to make besides just the head and shoulders and then it fades away. It's I'll do environments, I'll do objects, I'll do the full character now, I'll do a team of characters. Like, and it's, it's kind of because I'm able to flesh out their story a little bit better because I have this, this knowledge of you know, like a base knowledge of like, well, what could their story be? What would an author write for them? And, you know, being able to put those little cues about what the story is into the artwork. So like what you said, like, okay, earlier on, there's a character and maybe there's a knife in the background, you know, why is there a knife in the background? And like, you can get into all of that sort of stuff. But then I think even to take it a step further, let those decisions drive how you approach actually like where is your camera placed in this artwork and things like that and using all of that to convey like you know is, is the knife a, a danger because then you're going to put it in a different part of the the frame is is the knife like is somebody coming back from protecting the perimeter or something then it's going to be in a totally different area and kind of being able to use these little bits of story to kind of do the do the thinking for you you know it's like you don't have to come up with every little detail from scratch and think about it super hard kind of just think about like what is this character doing here what what part of the plot are they in is is this kind of like the false victory part because then then we're going to want to put things in like a little bit of a darker cast even if even if they're succeeding in this moment, you know, something has to feel off because that's the part of the story they're in. And, and kind of having this framework of structural knowledge that you then like plug your events into sometimes can just get your gears turning a little bit better. Yeah. And uh, so uh, are you a filmmaker as well? Uh, actually, it's funny that you mentioned that uh, me and my wife have done a couple little projects together. Just we recently bought a camera and we just kind of have been doing cool little stuff with it. But uh, she actually filmed the web series a couple years ago now. And we're working on uh, putting out like a little short film thriller that we should have out in a couple months now. And and that's again, that's kind of a byproduct of starting to take more of an interest in narrative it's like you know i never thought of myself as being someone who had the skill set to to be a filmmaker in any way but kind of having that structural foundation of like how to tell stories and then that that drive every artistic person has to express something more than what reality is showing them it's like it kind of just happens organically if you have a camera sitting around uh, so it, it, it's an interesting thing because I think it's kind of like my brother's a really good musician and he learned to play piano first. And he always told me once he learned how to play piano, everything else came really naturally to him. And I think in a lot of ways, even though I'm not primarily a, a writer at all, I, I definitely started out more visual. Uh, I think learning like narrative structure and some storytelling fundamentals is kind of like knowing how to play the piano but for for a whole series of arts where storytelling is kind of the backbone of what you're trying to do yeah and there there's uh, you you mentioned something because uh this idea of the backbone and what i thought was really great is I was looking at this artwork the other day from a, a fellow student in a, in a different in a school that I'm in. And um, so uh, and or actually they were T.A. I think they're like teaching assistant. And I saw this art piece and I just was so amazed because she put so many pieces into the background of it. Like uh, there was a character, um, 
there was a character and you know she, she i think it was inspired by like goosebumps or something so it's kind of scary but she is a, a female character with her hus- supposedly husband's head on a little plate and you know he's sitting in the background but what i thought was so interesting about this piece was that there was every like I wanted to know about like everything in that photo. Like there was like a calendar with like a swimsuit model on it. And then there was like a a trail of blood and then, you know, the TV was on and there was just like so many interesting things in the background that, you know, you bring up this, this idea of the backbone of the story, you know, where most of us artists, or at least, you know, me personally, I can't speak for all artists, but you know, when, when I, at least I'm guessing that many artists that first start graphically, you know, they, they want to just draw the character or just draw like the cool looking environment. But, you know, we can forget about what's in the background, I guess. Is one I way think that it. that definitely like in my experience really affects how people receive your art. You know, it's it's one thing to just generate something that's just cool and like there's definitely a utility to that and like everybody loves stuff that's just cool you know but I think if you really want people to engage it's like you said you just sat there and we're picking apart all the little facets of what she had created and it's it's that whole like a picture is worth a, a thousand words you know like and if you're if you're like actually somebody who knows how to use that to your advantage I mean I think you could say a lot more than a thousand words with with just the right type of image you know and that's that's part of the fun of being an artist is that like you know you get to challenge yourself to think about what is it I want to say what 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 am I feeling right now what kind of situations are analogous to that feeling and and kind of what's the story behind this feeling and how do I translate that into images and arrange those images in a way that that express that effectively and I think it taking that little extra step to put that piece of yourself into it and to really be sharing something of even if it's just like the feeling you personally get from a specific sunset in a specific location that's something that can be really hard to put into words but you can search after that feeling visually. You can try to recreate something that that looks the way that felt. And, you know, even though that doesn't have a lot of complicated parts to it, it's like if you can hit that color scheme just right, you know, you can capture that that inexpressible sensation. And that's something really cool about visual art that, you know, it's it's able to transcend what you can communicate verbally. And I think putting that that kind of vulnerability or that honesty or just that that truth about something you experienced into everything you do it, it's definitely going to drive more people to to connect with you yeah and it's great that you're bringing that up too because i was just listening to this uh an audio book and it was talking about how like visually um I, i'm sure you've seen one of those like uh, optical illusions where they have like arrows pointing, one's pointing in and the other one's pointing out and you have to figure out like which arrows lo- or which lines longer, but they're both like the same length or something like that, right? Some yeah, version of yeah. that. And no matter what, no matter how many times like you look at it, you still think like one's longer or one's, you know, not as long as the other, no matter how much you know. And what I thought was so great about what you just mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's relevant is this idea that, you know, as you're creating visual experiences, like, you know, there are certain things that just give us a certain feeling that, you know, as a viewer, we don't really think about. And, you know, it is the responsibility of the artist or the create the creator of that, the filmmaker, the photographer, the, the graphic artist, whatever it is to have us get that feeling with without us even knowing, you know, without us even knowing that illusion is there to to help to catch those sensations. So, um that that's awesome and i just thought it was so interesting because i just heard it this morning or, or like a couple few hours ago and now that you're bringing it up it's like oh wow that is really powerful it is our responsibility as artists to you know help to capture those things that you know cause us to react in some way emotionally or whatever and do that visually 
And uh, there's so many great ideas that, you know, as artists, we can learn whether you're a filmmaker using certain types of colors, as you were saying, or um, things like that. So awesome. Yeah. And uh, I think that that really is the uh, the cool thing about being able to to be an artist. And and that's that's an important thing to keep in mind, going back to the whole like, you know, let's say you're somebody who who has that narrative of I'm not where I want to be artistically. And it's it's, you know, kind of creating a lack of motivation for you. It's kind of it's one of those ways for me, at least it felt like a bit of a shortcut to getting a reward out of my art was like, all right, my, my rendering skills may be lacking, but if I can really put something into the story or if I can really express something that resonated for me and I can do my best to get that, that concept out onto the page, even if it's not the most beautiful depiction of it, you know, there's going to be somebody out there. I mean, with all the people on the planet, there, there's somebody out there who it's going to hit the same for them as it did for you. And, you know, you can connect to them through that. Like art, art is kind of a, it's like a language that communicates with a more subtle part of your, of your mind, you know, it's, and, and it's exactly like you said, like just being able to connect to that part of people that they might not even be aware of, like what's really happening, but you know, you can get to that, I, I think, without being like a, a Leonardo da Vinci level renderer, you know, like it's it's something about what you're expressing and not necessarily about how how skillful you are in your technique, or at least I hope. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, at some level, and this, I think, goes more into like, you know, personal branding and like, you know, who you're able to find as a customer, how you're able to get relate to the people that want to see the work that you do. And um, I, I see a lot of great Instagram influencers in the arts. And, you know, I'm in, you know, both of us are in art classes and I'm in like an art, uh, uh, a few art classes as well. And like, I see some of these teachers and they're so like, they're very like, you have to do it this way. You know, it's got to be perfect, perfect your draftsmanship. And then there's these artists who, you know, they're, they're really good. But, you know, I don't think they would pass like a fi super fine art class where like the teacher's like, oh, he should have like a PhD and he's like, you know, over analytical about your art. But, you know, they're incredibly successful. And I know it's not like good to depend on, you know, your skill if it's not up to the par of like the finest in the world. But at some level, I, I think what what is relevant to what you were saying is, you know, there's some branding involved. There's some level of finding an audience that can appeal to because at one level you know there's uh you know highly skilled artists and yeah you you, you might appeal to the really really skilled artists who admire your work and you know they want to learn from you but you know the very 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 highly skilled artists um you know if people want to learn from you they're probably already very skilled and you know that's a small like group of people like fine fine exceptional artists but i think the most of us can really learn from the people who are I don't want to say like average skilled, but like, you know, right in like the middle, right? Because you've got all the beginners up to intermediate who can kind of pick up something from, you know, people that are not so beyond reach that uh, it's like, I'd have to work 25 years just to get up there, you know? And what I think is great about the class that we're in together at, at uh, DPS with Hardy is, you know, he makes a lot of the skills and the, the ideas really accessible. Um, but that's just, you know, going going off on a tangent about like, just thinking about the the marketing aspect of art you know because there, there's so many great art like uh, there's so many great artists that i think that we just simply don't know about just because they either don't put their work out there or you know they're super private but fortunately um i think social media has given an opportunity for that so I, i'd like to get your thoughts where do you think is that that gap or you know where where it comes together for between skill and like marketing because as we know as you probably know like Andy Warhol right he struggled as an artist for many years but it wasn't until like he found that one thing that was like kind of catchy that he just banked on and he just you know put put that in until he just put the work in and made stuff like uh the the popular Campbell soup can that style of artwork for until you know I guess he couldn't do it anymore but what are your thoughts on that uh well I think it's I mean, the whole, 
having my work out there in a way where I have an audience or something, that still completely eludes me. I'm definitely one of those artists who is still lurking behind the scenes, I think. But, uh, you know, I think it's one of those things where as I go forward, I'm really kind of banking on the idea that, and, and this is something like you mentioned, we're in uh, the DPS course together with Hardy. And I try to do that with all of our assignments on there. You know, I take the prompt and then I, I kind of try to say like, okay, well, I don't wanna just do it exactly as it was done in the demo videos and stuff. I wanna think about a, a backstory here. I wanna think about like, uh, you know, why is this pistol shaped this way? What does that say about the character who wields it? What is, you know, all of these little other factors and, for me, it's like, I want to kind of keep approaching it like that. Like even with, uh, you know, like you were saying about not being the most, the most like technically PhD level artist or anything, but like I'm in like a Dungeons and Dragons group and I do the artwork for our group. And it's one of those things where like, I'm always kind of a little self-conscious because it's like, I know these guys, I know they'll, you know, it'll be awkward if they don't like it because we're also friends, you know? And, and so like every time I'll, I'll drop something in the group, I'm kind of like tense, but it's, it's one of those things that because I've taken the time to like really get involved in the story because I'm playing through it with them, there's that, that kind of, that foundation of like, this really connects with them. And I think that's probably gonna end up being relevant as I moved towards trying to get my brand out there a little more, that kind of, I'm really banking on, I'm hoping to just try to connect with, with people who are, who are stumbling across it. I think, you know, I am starting off getting back into art only in the last year or so after 15 to 20 years of, of hiatus, uh, you know, and I, I think I, I'm, catching up quickly but what I'm really counting on is that I can I can connect and that that will kind of hopefully generate more of a response than than a super technically talented render because I also think about like when when me and my wife were first getting into like shooting short films and stuff it was like you know, we didn't know what we were looking at. So we couldn't really tell the difference between good and elite level stuff, you know, because it's like, you just don't have your eyes adjusted to see those little finer points. And I think that's, that's something that can really hold artists back from putting, pushing themselves as a brand is like, you're spending all this time learning how to critique art so you can critique your own art, but you have to consider you've spent that much more time learning the finer points of what makes something good or bad. The average person who just sees an image, you know, they're, they're not noticing half the stuff you're probably noticing, you know, and, and that's different if you're talking about getting jobs, you know, where you're going to be hired by a really talented artist that you're going to be working under who's supervising a project, you know, they're, they're going to know exactly what you're doing wrong. But I, I think when it comes to like, you know, social media, like you were saying, like, I mean, most people who are going to be blown away by your art are going to be blown away by it, whether it's, it's elite or just good, because they're not going to really see those finer points about what makes the difference. And, you know, I think for me, like, like all artists, it seems I, I really struggle with putting my art in front of people, because it is very vulnerable. And it, it goes back to, that's kind of, again, the downside to putting so much of yourself into something is then it, it, it really matters what people think about it, you know? And, and like, I think that's one of those things that I try to push myself through that by looking at it like, you know, I think me five years ago would have been blown away by what me right now is making, even though I'm not right now all the time. And most people who are going to see this are not even me five years ago. They're, they're people who have never even thought to create art and what it might take and what might make it good versus bad. And they're just either going to connect with it or they're not because of, of something you put in it that connects with them, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent. And 
um, you know, I, I, I was, this, this brings up the, this topic of, um, you know, the difference between commercial art, fine art, and then just making like crazy wacky stuff. I mean, maybe that goes in the category of fine art, who knows? I mean, depending on how skilled it is. Right. But like, you know, crazy wacky art that people just like to see. And at some level, you know, we got to also think about that, you know, career wise. And um, when it comes to that, like, the, the technical skills, I think, you know, can, can reveal themselves as you're, you know, as you're like find, finding the gap between or filling that gap between, you know, the high level skill that's required to do like great commercial art that is, you know, appealing, that people get, that people understand. I mean, I think where, where some of your ideas really come in in terms of the narrative is, you know, to be able to obviously put the story in front of them so that they get it and that they understand and that they're intrigued and compelled. And then, you know, you got the fine artists who can just draw whatever they want and, you know, do it in a very nice way. Well, they don't draw whatever they want, but like, you know, you, you get the idea is that some of them can get away with like modern abstract fine art. They can get away with just, you know, doing whatever, but um, yeah, I mean, some, some interesting things there in terms of, you know, what to create, whether you're deciding on a commercial side of things or, you know, whether you want to be a fine artist and go down that route or anything like that. Um, so it sounds like you are moving in a direction of like fine art films. Um, I think you're, I think you're a photographer too. Is that? Is that uh, well, I, uh, I kind of helped my wife out with her photography business. So I've gotten decent at it just because she, has drilled me on everything a couple of times, but you know, it, I would say I'm definitely like my ultimate aim is, is to kind of be doing like illustrations for, for stories, you know, maybe doing book covers. Uh, I love doing stuff for like D and D groups and, and like artwork for things like that, because there's so much narrative in it. And, uh, you know, ultimately, like I said, I'm, I'm working on this, sci-fi fantasy story right now and I want to maybe turn it into a big illustrated compendium of the world building and, and things like that but really I, I think my main goal with art is to bring stories to life you know because it, it always just hits so much harder when when there's a really compelling image to go along with the story and and I think that's the part that gets me really excited about making art is is that breathing life into something that was that was just imagination like here it is in front of you now yeah and that is seriously uh compelling the idea that you just shared of creating compendium i mean so do you do you you mean like literally drawing an enti entire encyclopedia of all the characters and things inside the universe that you're creating is that oh absolutely yeah I, I mean that's I, like that's I, great. I grew up I was uh, I was 10 or 11 when Star Wars Episode One came out and like 10 or 11 year old me was blown away by that movie. Like now I look back at it, it's like that was very goofy. But like at, at the time I was just like blown away by it. And all I wanted to do was like create Star Wars stuff. And, and you know, I had all the books of like, you know, basically it's like the Star Wars Atlas where it's it's all the stuff about the world building. And I was just like totally fascinated by that. And so that's kind of like I was saying before, like, you know, I think you, you get to the final, the final boss battle when it's like, you know, in your own personal narrative, when you're, you're starting to like get to the point where it's time to hold the thing tangibly, you know, and that's right now, that's like the big storyline I'm on is like, I have this this massive world building endeavor that I'm I'm working towards and you know chipping away at it slowly but I I really have like I'm I'm maybe being a little overly ambitious with how much detail I want to include in it but it's it's one of those things where it's like it's a passion project it's it's kind of the thing I'm the most excited about and I'm not burning out on it at all so it, you know for me right now it's like the more detailed I can make this the better I, I know I would love to see something like that. So I, I think that's a, another fun part of art is like 
trying to create for other people that feeling that you had when you were really impressed by something. And for me, I've always really loved like just a, a mind bogglingly detailed atlas of world building, you know? Yeah. And that's great because, you know, on one hand as artists, you know, we think about what we can create and like, you know, what we can build, but we, but what you just mentioned right there is when you create a universe, I think you create a lot of opportunities. I mean, if it goes big, right? Like, I mean, you think about Stan Lee and, you know, the hundreds or thousands of artists that, you know, Marvel or is DC Marvel, Marvel, you know, the thousands of artists that he was able to employ just because he created these amazing fantasy characters that, you know, they helped to illustrate other versions of it. Um, You know, and then we think about just Star Wars itself. I mean, you think about all the thousands of, artists that are now working because they they get to portray so many characters i mean he created so many characters that he just needs so many artists to not only act in the movies but also like to to do all the the graphic novels and you know cartoons and all that so um you know i think that talking about having a big narrative and all that i mean that's once you create that universe yes that's that's amazing but like I mean, to, to also be able to give other artists the opportunity to also like, you know, be able to contribute to something really, really exciting and fun like that is uh, also, I think, a compelling idea as well. And all right. So very cool stuff. I mean, uh, thanks for jumping on to this. And you mentioned uh, about your Dungeons and Dragons group. And before the show, I thought that was such a fun idea because from an artist perspective, you know, most people think of artists like, oh, you know, they're, they're introverted. They don't really want to like put their work out there. You know, they, uh, they don't really want to like, you know, push anybody to, 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 I guess, even ask them about working for them or whatever. But um, you did mention that your Dungeons and Dragons group was like one of the first people that were like, hey, can you do this work for us? Like, so what I think is really great is this idea of like finding your first fans, having, you know, finding the first people that are willing to, you know, be taking interest in the stuff that you're doing. So uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, how, how did that even get started? Like, what's, what do you actually draw for the, the group? Yeah, so that's like, I think that is is a really cool thing to have as an artist who's maybe, you know, getting back to taking it more seriously after after not being as focused or or even just somebody who feels like they're more at like a beginner intermediate phase. Like, you know, it's it was really cool to have, you know, people that I knew and it wasn't just this like kind of sterile professional relationship where it's like, you either succeed or you fail and like your relationship with this person hinges upon it, you know, and, and kind of having that freedom to, you know, kind of work with somebody who it's like, okay, I know at the end of the day, we're all still buds, you know, and it it takes some of that, like that fear out of, you know, doing this type of work. But, you know, I think the really fun thing about working in stuff like, I mean, this is true of like Star Wars, Dungeons and Dragons, like really everything we've mentioned so far is, you know, operating within this this pre-existing world that's been built and kind of, you know, having this baseline of there are these certain images, there are these, you know, there there's already a visual language for this world. But, you know, every D&D group, you know, for the most part, unless you're just playing right out of a book, like, you know, ours is very homebrew so it's like there's a lot of world building that went into that and you know it's been really fun to kind of take the pre-existing visual language of Dungeons and Dragons and you know bring to life images from these stories that we're personally playing through every Sunday night and you know a lot of what that is is kind of you know we'll kind of be in a in a phase of like right now we're actually about to start a new campaign And uh, my one friend did like a ton of world building work. And so right now it's kind of like, he he has to be careful with what he's telling me because I'm going to be playing through this world and he doesn't want to spoil too much. But, you know, it's like, okay, so there's this city that all the first parts of our story is going to take place in. And so right now I'm doing a lot of, 
you know, architectural stuff. And like, there's this big temple that has these pillars on the sides of it and kind of, you know, just bringing, bringing this world to life so that we have like some key shots and stuff like that, that maybe we can have up in the background while we're playing. And, and it just sets the tone for like, okay, now we all have this exact same visual of like, where are our characters right now? Oh, we're here. And it looks just like this. And, you know, when they first walk into this market square from this alleyway, here's the view. This is what they see. And, and it again goes back to just that whole bringing story to life and like using concept art to to kind of just provide that extra layer of reality to something that was taking place solely in imagination before. And it's, it's a lot of fun to work on stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's like you created your, your own, you know, your own, your own commission for D and I mean, obviously it's not officially D and D, but like, you know, you, you created your own, your own little thing, you know, your own, business there you know um but anyway all right so that is really interesting this idea that you know you're built helping your friends and your you know your close close friends and all that build this this universe and it sounds like you have like a uh a designer you know obviously the person that designs the world and i think in video games they also have someone who you know designs the overall like you know how things are going to be in the video game but at the same time that that's a really good like relationship there because if you're the graphic artists and all that you don't have you don't always have the luxury of spending a lot of time just to come up with a design of everything so like i think that's a really good like cohesive partnership and you know i'm get, i'm gonna guess based on what you've been sharing that you work pretty well together right oh for sure yeah i i think it's uh it it like it can be very meditative when you're just thinking about like okay i already have the world i have the visual language what I'm doing right now is just focusing on how do I bring this specific scenario to life? And, you know, I think that that's something too, like what you were saying earlier, actually about, yeah, it's all very homebrew right now. And, you know, I'm working with like close friends on this, but, uh, you know, it's all practice for stuff where those are all portfolio pieces. Then, you know, these are all things that, you know, when we start like actually getting into it and we, we get like a lot under our belt, under, uh, under our belt with this, it's like, I'll have this whole catalog of D and D universe compatible artwork. And, you know, who knows what that turns into then it, it maybe does become a little bit more high level or even just using something like that to generate commissions, you know, from other D and D groups and stuff like that. So you know, uh, something like that, I think, is going to prove very useful in in spiraling out into other opportunities, because that's something I noticed with my wife and her photography business was, you know, she would go out and uh, I actually really picked this up from her. She would kind of make a brief for herself where she'd be like, OK, I want to do like a faux wedding shoot, uh, you know, even in the beginning when she wasn't getting wedding jobs. So she would get two friends together and be like, can you bring a suit and a dress? And like, you know, just let me shoot you guys, you know, oh, that's hilarious. That's fun. That's fun. Yeah. And, and it's like, you know, it starts out as, as something very homemade where it's just our friends pretending to get married to each other and her taking pictures, but you know, then, then it turns into real work. And like, you know, she's had that happen with like product shoots. She's had that happen with wedding shoots now. Like, you know, it, it kind of starts off there, but it again goes to like, we as artists see things from the inside, you know, like we, we see how the sausage is made, you know, but from an outside viewpoint, looking in, like they don't know that the, this wasn't a real wedding. This, it looks real. It's, it's full quality in the, in the photo. And that's really the part they're looking at. Uh, you know, so I, I think that's going to be like, a big strategy for me going forward is kind of, you know, I want to help my friends bring their ideas to life, but you know, that's also experience for me that that kind of happens in like a, a tutorial mode where you're not fully on the hook to like this, you know, this boss figure or something. It's like, 
you're starting out with your friends and, and demonstrating that you can do that other work. And then, and then you have all this evidence of that, you know, when you're, when you're done doing the fun stuff with your friends, it's, it's there to prove that you're capable. Yeah. And that is totally a great message to summarize a lot of what we're saying. I think it's very motivational. This, the concept that you just shared of, um, you know, even if you're just starting out or wherever you are in your career and you're looking to get into something such as wedding photography, concept art, um, you know, whatever it is, whether you want to be a filmmaker or something, really just starting where you are, you know, if you can't find a wedding, go make your own, you know, get a couple friends together and make your own wedding. If you're, you know, looking to get into concept art or graphic art, find someone that wants to just give you briefs and start making art for those briefs. I mean, starting where you are and that's where you can really start to build like relationships and things like that, that are, and skills that are going to be really helpful to you. So, man, thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is Darko Silverstein. And um, with that, what's the best way to reach you? Uh, yeah. It, uh, well, thanks for having me. First of all, it's been really fun talking about all this stuff. Uh, you can find me on ArtStation. I'm Darko Silverstein on ArtStation. On Instagram, I am Real Darko Arts. And if you want to contact me for commissions or anything, realdarkoarts at gmail.com. All right, everybody, and have a great day. And thanks for listening.